Health Institute of Technology, uh, and his talk is titled uh, Role of Path Information in Visual Perception of Joint Stiffness. Can you guys um, see my screen? Yep, you're good. Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I'm Michael West. I'm a third year graduate student at MIT. This project was in collaboration with um, Professor Megan Huber at University of Massachusetts and my PI, Nova Hogan at MIT. <clears throat> so uh, just to motivate the idea of the, this project, humans have, if I can play this video, humans have a, a very good ability to extract latent information from visual observation of biological motion. This is best shown in point light animations where you can see um, in this video, someone who is uh, trying to jump, previously the person was walking, um, and uh, you know, climbing stairs as well. And this this idea has been advanced such that people can determine um, age, gender, uh, even emotions from these point light animation videos. However, um, we came to ask, can humans perceive limb stiffness from visual observation of motion? And we believe this question is important uh, for two reasons. One, we have found that modulation of stiffness or more generally mechanical impedance is important for neural motor control during physical interaction. And two, identifying abnormalities in muscle impedance is often used during rehabilitation after someone has lost uh, motor function. Thus, we hope extending this work can provide a new rehabilitation method. So previously, we ran a set of experiments where we simulated an arm motion that had varying stiffness. Um, we, get, we let subjects view multiple simulations, um, and we found that, yes, subjects can estimate changes in stiffness from visual observation of motion. Um, you can check our previously cited work uh, here. However, the question still remains, how? And we hypothesize that this is due to the relationship between motor action and motor perception. Furthermore, we believe that our model used to simulate uh, this motion was congruent with how humans produce their own motion, which I'll go into greater detail uh, later. Nonetheless, we're still unsure what motion cues humans are using to estimate stiffness. So in a set of new experiments, we aim to answer that question. Um, specifically, we draw upon the literature of the one-third power law, um, which is basically a mathematical relationship of the velocity profile during, during upper, upper limb reaching. And we hypothesize that in our previous experiments, uh, our simulations uh, typically did follow this power law, so we hypothesized based off of this literature that manipulations of the velocity profile that violate this one-third power law will inhibit subjects' ability to estimate stiffness. So as I mentioned before, we found that subjects can estimate stiffness using only visual observation of motion. And this is a remarkable feat when you consider the definition of stiffness and that it's the relationship between force and motion. And in this uh, experiment, subjects had no access to force information. Um, so in a, in a series of three experiments, we, um, where we either uh, modulated both the shoulder and elbow stiffness, either the, uh, or just the elbow stiffness or just the shoulder stiffness, um, we found that subjects were able to increase their stiffness ratings um, with the simulated joint stiffness. So there's this positive linear effect of simulated joint stiffness on rating. Um, and this is our previous work, but the question still remains how. Um, and I think to answer that question, we need to draw upon um, the underlying controller that was used to simulate these joint motions. So here we see this complex control law, um, but really it's very quite simple. Um, what it does is it has the, the superposition of two impedances um, that act as separate attractors. Um, and then the first one is a spring damper system that pulls the endpoint of the arm around a nominal trajectory, which in our simulations we define to be in a, a, a circle. And that's what these two terms take care of here. The second attractor is the stiffness at the uh, shoulder and elbow joints. And um, what that does is pull the arms to a nominal configuration. And this is the, the stiffness in these joints is what we uh, change. And that's taken care of in this term here. Specifically, what, what we modulated with this was this KQ value, this KQ value. And, um, and uh, that, is, that is what we found subjects were able to, that's what we hope subjects will be able to tease out um, from our simulations. And that's what we found as well. So the, the, the fact that humans are able to estimate changes in joint stiffness from visual observation of motion uh, leads to two key conclusions. One, humans assume stiffness affects motion. And two, it is likely that humans produce their own motion. Uh, the, it is likely that how humans produce their own motion is congruent with the control law used in our simulation. Um, this comes back to the relationship between motor action and motor perception. We believe that if this controller uh, can be perceived, it is likely that this controller tells us something about motor action as well. 
um, if subjects are using, and that, that's under the assumption that subjects are using their knowledge of how their, their own control, their knowledge of how they produce their own control when they're perceiving these, these, um, these simulations. So just to summarize, this control law is very complex, yet subjects, subjects were able to identify a single parameter with, or identify changes to a single parameter within it. Um, and again, the question still remains, how? And what we aim to ask was, are they looking at past information or is simple information important as well? Um, and the way we did this was through two, uh, two methods. And the first was um, while keeping the past information the same from our previous experiments, we manipulated the velocity profile, the temporal information. And what that means is generally, and in our first simulations, um, the, it's been consistent with the, with the literature of this two thirds power law, which is just this mathematical relationship here. And what it, that, what it relates is radius of curvature to velocity via this, um, this uh, exponent beta, which usually equals one third. And in, this, in our biological case, what that simply means is that when you're moving around uh, an ellipse, uh, path with curvature, you go faster around the straight edges and you slow down around the curves. So what we did was in these new simulations, we manipulated that velocity profile such that in experiment one, we had a constant velocity where we set beta equal to zero. In experiment two, um, we set beta equal to negative one third where this, there's this reverse velocity radius of curvature relationship. And uh, what that means is subjects are going slower around the straight edges and faster around the curves. And then experiment three, there was no velocity radius of curvature relationship. And I'll explain how um, we manipulated that a bit later. The second thing we did was we asked subjects to write down the strategy they used to estimate stiffness. Um, and we we're trying to see if subjects could articulate what it was and we, if we can gather information from that as well. So our new simulations um, took the same uh, Path, it's the same uh, path, but recall the video that I showed you earlier, subjects were only, they could not see this path. They could only see the motion of the arm. And we took the experiment where we kept the shortest stiffness the same, modulated the elbow stiffness. So we had 30 new subjects, uh, 10 for each of the three new experiments, and they watched 30 arm simulations, um, each with, uh, and the arm simulations had six different elbow stiffness conditions shown here. Um, and they saw each condition um, five times in the block randomized order, and then they rated their stiffness on a scale from one to seven. So you can see here in the, uh, the exper the, uh, our new experiment one, that the, the velocity is constant all around the, uh, the path, right? In experiment two, we see that subjects are going slow around the straight edges and faster around the curves. That's the reverse velocity curvature relationship. In experiment three, there's no parallel relationship here. What we did was we took the time series that was computed to make a constant velocity, uh, uh, transition velocity around the curvature for the 50 newton meter per radian stiffness simulation and applied that to all of the um, all of the simulations as well. So there was no velocity curvature relationship in experiment three. And what we found was actually really, uh, really interesting, right? So we hypothesized that manipulations of the velocity curvature relationship would affect subjects' ability to estimate stiffness, but what we found was the opposite. It did not. Um, so subjects were still able to uh, to increase their stiffness ratings based off of the simulated joint stiffness, um, despite these velocity, uh, despite these velocity manipulations. What we see here is all the subjects' individual data, and um, you can see their their uh, the simulated joint stiffness and their their uh, chosen stiffness rating. And what we did was we set a linear model to that, and we defined the goodness fit of the linear model by the coefficient of determination, and we determined that we use that as a metric of subjects' performance. Um, so a perfect linear relationship would mean you know, uh, uh, would, would be a high uh, coefficient of determination means subject did the task very well. And using the coefficient of determination R squared as a measure of subject's ability to estimate stiffness, when we go ahead and look at um, the distribution of this R squared value across the uh, three new experiments and the original experiment, what we found was experiment had no effect on subject's ability to estimate stiffness. So subjects were able to estimate stiffness um, equally the same regardless of how we uh, are statistically equally the same regardless of what manipulations we made to the velocity profile. And remember the second thing we did was we, after, after, after subjects completed the study and saw the simulations, we asked them to write down the strategy they used. This is an open-ended question. Subjects could have used, um, could have said anything. They could, um, some subjects even drew pictures. What we wanted to do was tease out the information. We were specifically looking at whether subjects use path information, temporal information, joint motion, or endpoint motion. And uh, we codified that just that there was a yes or no for each one of those quantities. And what we looked for for path information specifically was the words distance, displacement, range of motion, angle. For temporal information, speed, rate, acceleration. 
or for joint motion, joint, shoulder, elbow, angle, and then for endpoint motion, endpoint or hand. And then also if subjects drew a picture and pointed to the endpoint or the joint, um, we were able to codify that as well. And what we found was that most subjects reported using path information and joint information. However, many subjects could not actually articulate um, what strategy they used. So they did, their, their response was not codified in any of these ways. Um, and the, the most surprising result is that none of the four motion features that subjects used actually were significant predictors of subjects' ability to raise stiffness. So if you look at the motion features that subjects reported using, and the R squared value, or the coefficient of determination, which we've decided is a measure of how well subjects are able to do the task, we can see this wide range of performance. Um, so this kind of tells us that, okay, subjects may not necessarily be able to articulate what it is that they're doing. We have hypothesized that this may be because estimating stiffness is something that's so fundamental to the internal model. It's something that we can't necessarily articulate what we're doing because we're doing it very innately. So to conclude, um, we found that humans can correctly infer changes in limb stiffness from non-trivial changes in multi-joint limb motion. And they can do this despite the manipulations to the velocity profile. And this suggests that stiffness or more generally mechanical impedance is encoded in subject's internal model used to do this task. Um, and secondly, it suggests that path information predominates temporal information and the visual perception of stiffness. Um, and what exactly did we do here? We used perception to learn more about motor action, right? So we use this idea of just can subjects perceive this controller? Well, if they're using what they know about their own motion, um, and if they can perceive this controller, it's likely that this controller is somewhat congruent or there has some congruencies with the motor action. And then secondly, we believe that um, by answering the question, how are subjects estimating stiffness from visual observation, we can kind of move towards a new, uh, less encumbering method of, stiff, uh, of rehabilitation um, for those who have lost motor function. Um, just want to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Professor Megan Huber at UMass Amherst and my PI at Neville Hogan on my funding sources. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My email is amwestjr at mit.edu. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michael. That was great. That was an excellent talk. Um, if anybody has questions, you can go ahead and post them uh, in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to get a, go ahead and get us started with uh, one observation that I had, which was that that path really seemed so we didn't have an example a visual visual example of what the stiff changes in speed and or temporal information as you called it um, would have looked like but it really seemed like the paths varied dramatically across stiffness conditions so that seemed like if a, a very salient um, manipulation i'm wondering if you had a way of making the temporal information uh, of altering the, if you altered the temporal information in some way, could you change the stiffness rating? Like if you made, instead of smooth transitions in speed, if you had made the speed, the transitions in speed, like more jerky, or you added some stochasticity to the, to the movement, whether that would also be interpreted as stiffness. Does that make sense? Kind of, I guess uh, your question was two parts. So I guess yeah. the first part, um, you said you didn't see a good uh, explanation of what exactly was going on. Here's a, a, a visual of all the simulations that subjects would have seen um, just by each experiment. Um, but in the second part, you kind of asked, well, can you repeat the second part again? So I guess I'll rephrase the second part as, do you, do you think that there's a temporal manipulation that you could apply that would also, that would also look like stiffness? So if somebody if a person who's uh, has extreme joint stiffness might be able to make a full circle, but it could be like a little bit more uh, jerky in the movement, like maybe there's more stopping and starting. So it's not um, in the way that you had very two, two very smooth, like acceleration and decelerations. If you added more stochasticity to the uh, speed of the arm movement or the, the limb movement in this case, would that yeah. mimic or make somebody have a similar effect and make somebody think that it's a stiff joint. Yeah, so it's, I guess what you're saying is, can you find a velocity profile such that subjects are unable to actually estimate stiffness? And I think or, that- or is, there, is there a different, it's not necessarily, can, we, can you trick them into not being able to, have to estimate stiffness, but more that, is there a different velocity profile that we would associate with stiffness? Like, is there a, it, does velocity have a specific profile that we think think of as stiffness. Does that so make sense? I'll, yeah, I would say that the 
And to that specific question, these results would suggest that no, right? So we've been able to manipulate the velocity profile to something that humans don't typically do. Um, and we've done it in three different cases. And we found that consistently subjects are still able to estimate stiffness. So this tells us that subjects probably aren't using velocity pro uh, information to estimate stiffness, right? They're using motion information. And I think um, it's possible that, you know, we could find, um, it, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that's falsifiable saying that, you know, there, there's not a such, there's, yeah. <laughs> I can't simply say there's no um, velocity profile that, that, that doesn't work. Yeah. So uh, one question just popped up in the Q and A. Uh, so you can address that uh, during the next talk, but we're going to have to move on uh, unfortunately, but yeah. So if you can go ahead and type your answer uh, to that question there, um, but thank you again. That was really uh, very interesting work there. Thank you. Um, so we've got a final talk in this session from uh, Aya.